Freaky, the 2020 high school body swap slasher movie. In this video, we're gonna journey into its deeper meaning. We're gonna be thinking about its symbolism. We'll be thinking about the relationship between the physical body and consciousness. We'll be thinking about the connections to the Happy Death Day films and much more. But wait, I hear you cry. This is just another silly Blumhouse film. It doesn't have anything deeper going on. Just you wait. Okay, let's start where it starts. Classic high school slasher opening. Four carefree teenagers sitting around a campfire in the garden of a mansion, sharing urban legends about a local serial killer known as the Blissfield Butcher. As it happens, he's real. And he's here. According to the legends, he targets teenagers who are partying hard. When have we ever heard that before? It's a trope that's so well worn in the slasher genre that the characters can't help but discuss it with a rolling of the eyes. All the Blissfield Butcher stories are centered around homecoming, and a new legend pops up every year during homecoming week to warn Blissfield's teenagers of the dangers of underage debauchery. That's Ginny. She's a teenager who wants to have fun while her parents are out. And in her eyes, the Blissfield Butcher, whilst it might be rooted in some truth, is really nothing more than a cautionary tale that's used by parents to scare their children into being more sensible. Millie, do you have a date for homecoming tomorrow? I, um, I'm not, I'm not good going. She has a date with me. Seems a little weird to miss out on a seminal high school experience to go see sh regional theater with your mom. Oh, I'm sorry, aren't you supposed to discourage her from things like that? You know, it's just underage drinking, and God knows what else that can end in tragedy. That's the main character, Millie, and we'll come back to her. But it's always the way. The teenagers just want to have a good time. And it's the parents who are the killjoys. But as it happens, the caution of the parents is very quickly vindicated. None of the four teenagers we meet at the start survive past the opening titles. So the question remains. In slasher movies, why do the killers always show up at the teenage parties? Are these films morality tales, warning teenagers of the dangers of underage debauchery? Or is it something else? One of my viewers helpfully left this comment on my video about the Scream movies. It's more to do with the reckless abandonment of awareness and concern. The drive of social interaction with options of experiences is the advantage for the opportunist killers. And I think that's the line that director Christopher Landon goes for. He's not having a go at teenagers for wanting to party. In fact, the parties themselves are actually quite safe. There's safety in numbers. It's when a teenager breaks off from the group to fetch another drink that they become an easy target for the killer. It's worth saying though that even if a serial killer doesn't show up, these parties can still be dangerous. They're places where teenagers are more likely to cross boundaries and do things that they will later regret. So who is this Blissfield Butcher? He's a man called Quentin Shermer. We learn that since 1977, he has been a wanted criminal, and it seems that quite simply, he enjoys killing people. He's not trying to make some kind of statement through his work, he just gets a kick out of killing. This news broadcast from later in the film gives us some context. In slasher films, the mask and the weapon are important elements of the killer's twisted identity. They are carefully chosen because they are the tools with which the killer performs his work. And in the opening scene, we watch the Blissfield Butcher forge his identity as a figure to be feared. This mansion happens to be a treasure trove of historic artefacts. So he chooses a mask from a selection displayed above the staircase. The mask he goes for is incredibly simple, betraying no form of emotion. Cracked and weathered, it's a face of stone, and it's the perfect choice for this particular killer. He is a man of imposing stature with the ability to smash through windows and fences. He is a rock of a man with an unflinching resolve to demolish life. But it takes him longer to settle on a weapon. To enact the opening kills, he's just using the objects that are nearest to hand. A glass bottle, a toilet seat, a tennis racket, a spear. There's a restlessness to this. He's improvising. These objects do the job, but they're not quite what he's looking for. And then, an Aztec dagger called La Dola catches his eye. With a deep sense of satisfaction, perhaps at settling upon his weapon, he removes his mask 
and we see his face. Through this surprisingly early reveal, the film is telling us that the identity of the Blissfield Butcher isn't a mystery it wants to maintain. Freaky is not a whodunit, or at least it's not a whodunit from the perspective of the audience. It's interested in a different question. What happens if the killer and the victim swap bodies? We're going to enter spoiler territory. Our protagonist, Millie Kessler, is a student at Blissfield Valley High School. In this scene, she's waiting for a ride home after performing her duties as the mascot for the homecoming football game. The stage is set for the butcher to arrive. The high school mascot is a beaver, which is a notable choice. Beavers are fluffy creatures. They don't look especially dangerous, but their ability to gnaw through tree trunks with their large teeth is slightly terrifying. You don't want to get on the wrong side of a beaver, and that will become important. When the butcher arrives, Millie does what any reasonable person would do. She runs. But this is made difficult by the cumbersome beaver costume. The butcher catches up and stabs her with Lodola. And at this point, it's made abundantly clear that this is no ordinary dagger. For a moment, the setting transforms into a setting of an Aztec temple. And we're like, whoa, okay, this is a supernatural slasher movie. The stab wound on Millie's left shoulder is immediately mirrored on the butcher. Both characters are left dumbfounded. Whatever the butcher just did, he wasn't expecting it. He runs away. In the aftermath of the attack, we're given a fantastic slow motion shot. The camera pulls back from a bewildered Millie as her sister and mother try to comfort her in the police station. Millie's eyes are fixated on what? The dola, the dagger, as it makes its way into the frame inside a plastic evidence bag carried by an officer. This dagger has done something to Millie, and it's done something to the butcher as well. Ladola, an ancient Aztecian dagger used in ritual sacrifice? In horror films, transformations almost always occur at night, in the uncertainty of the darkness, when the boundaries between realms seem to become thin. Sleep itself represents a mini death of sorts. The body is plunged down into a hazy state of consciousness, a land of vivid dreams, to later re-emerge, renewed and refreshed for a new day. And as Thursday the 12th gives way to Friday the 13th, another reference there, Millie emerges from her sleep a completely different person. In fact, herself and the butcher have swapped bodies. That was the effect of the knife. And that means that the killer is now hiding within the body of an unassuming teenage girl. He is a wolf in sheep's clothing. He's here somewhere. He's wearing my body and he's wearing my face. He's like a wolf in sheep's clothing. This phrase originates from the words of Jesus spoken at his Sermon on the Mount. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. And that's exactly what we see. At first, the butcher is frustrated at the predicament, but then he starts to see it as an opportunity. With Millie's body, he can sneak right into the heart of the high school and enact his bloodlust one victim at a time. You're not thinking of going to school, are you? School? I mean, I know your friends must be worried about you, but... Friends. But not before giving Millie's appearance a makeover, and this is really disturbing. He decides that her regular clothing choices are inadequate, in his eyes. He wants something that will turn heads, and for that he ventures into the wardrobe of Millie's older sister, Shah. And here's the result. Notice the strutting into school, head held high, with lipstick and a leather jacket. Notice the contrast to Millie's first appearance. This is reminiscent of a classic high school story trope, the overnight transformation of the quiet girl into the cool girl. But here, it's not the exhilarating moment that it's normally framed as. Because this isn't Millie on a journey of self-discovery, this is the serial killer. And he is using her body to his own murderous ends. He wants to reappear to Millie's fellow students in a way that is surprising, enigmatic seductive. He wants to lure them in so that he can kill them. And it works. This also exposes the dark side of some of Millie's fellow students, especially some of the boys from the football team. What they want to do to her is truly abhorrent. So this dark turn of events is intercut with the comic relief of the real Millie finding herself inside the Blissfield Butcher's body. The Butcher is a wolf in sheep's clothing and Millie is now a sheep in wolf's clothing. 
She has a hard time convincing her two best friends that it's really her, but she manages to prove it by performing the mascot routine. And to help propel the story forwards, the film uses a classic storytelling device, the ticking clock. If Millie doesn't stab the butcher with the dola within 24 hours, the body swap will become permanent. He says here, if the sacrifice is not successful, the souls of the two persons are swapped and the change becomes permanente after 24 hours. Much of the comedy in Freaky comes from the fact that Millie and the butcher have such wildly different bodies. The contrast is what makes it funny, especially as we watch Vince Vaughn playing the role of a teenage girl. But the body swap also allows the film to reflect on the importance of our bodies. After spending the best part of a day inside the killer's body, Millie says this. I felt oddly empowered being in this body. When you're someone like me and you, you know, you've been bullied most of your life and you know, sort of just put down a lot, that... <laughs> You know, it, it, it does feel kind of good to just feel strong for once. Conversely, we see the killer getting frustrated by the limitations of Millie's body, or what he sees as limitations. Body's useless! But this, of course, is physical strength. It might be the most important form of strength in the killer's eyes, but it's not the only form of strength. Here's Millie's high school crush, Booker, to explain. Strength doesn't come from size. It doesn't. It comes from up here. And in there. And you are a lot stronger than you think. And then they try to kiss while Millie is still in the body of the butcher. You're still Millie to me. But Millie calls it off. It's too weird. The film really wants to say it's what's inside that counts, not the outward appearance, sure. But the physical body isn't irrelevant. In a sense, we are our bodies. We are made to be embodied. Not just souls floating around, but souls that are anchored, united, to bodies. Each unique soul is housed within a unique body, and so when Millie's not in her own body, it's not quite Millie. So the film captures something of the importance of the human body. Men and women are equal and gloriously different, and women don't need to be strong in exactly the same ways that men are strong. In the climactic confrontation with the butcher, Millie says this. I want my body back. Come and get it. Ultimately, Millie sees her own body as the gift that it is. It was taken from her, and she wants it back. Millie has lost her dad, and the fact that she ends up in the body of a grown man is perhaps a strange reminder of her loss. This comes to a head in the shop changing room scene. Millie's mother works there, she shows up and initiates a conversation, not realising that the man she's talking to is actually her daughter. I bought my husband a pink polo one year for Christmas. I bet it was his favourite shirt. He passed away a year ago. I lost somebody too. Really? I lost my dad. It's poignant because they're referring to the same dad, and in his absence, Millie's mother is finding it hard to let Millie go. Millie doesn't want to upset her. In this scene, they are having a conversation that, in a sense, is long overdue. And my other daughter, Millie, she's so quiet now. I can't figure out what's going on inside her head. Maybe she just needs some... some space. I am scared. She'll be graduating high school and running off to college and then I'll be left here. At this point, it's worth mentioning Christopher Landon's previous project with Blumhouse, the Happy Death Day films, in which Tree Gelbman comes to terms with the loss of her mother. The grief of losing a parent is a theme that Landon keeps returning to, and the mother-daughter relationship is the real focus, whereas in Happy Death Day, Tree learns to let her mother go. In Freaky, it is the mother who learns to let Millie go. Thankfully, in Freaky, both mother and daughter get to survive. It's about the mother letting Millie leave home and go to college. But that's still a big deal. This resonance across the two films has led people to ask whether they might be part of the same universe. Here's Landon speaking in an interview for Collider. I think that they exist in the same spiritual universe, so to speak. I think I could easily see Tree and Millie getting together and being like, well, you won't believe what happened to me. 
because I think that tonally they're connected. I think thematically they're connected in a weird way. Who knows, maybe one day we'll get a team-up movie with Millie and Tree. Let's see what happens. Human beings are made of stuff, and yet we each have a continuous experience of reality called consciousness. It's not clear how that arises. If I'm just a bag of bits, molecules clacking together, how can I experience stuff? Well, we've seen that in the understanding of the film, along with most anthropologies from around the world and down through history, a human being is not merely a material body. There's something more to you and me. Our consciousness or our spirit, whatever you want to call it. And in the high concept narrative of the film, two souls have swapped places, Millie's and the Butcher's. If the sacrifice is not successful, the souls of the two persons are swapped. The film uses the terms soul and spirit interchangeably, so it has what you might call a bipartite anthropology, two parts to the human, the physical material body and the immaterial soul slash spirit. So for the purposes of this review, I'll stick with that language, but it's worth noting that there are also tripartite anthropologies out there which make a distinction between the soul and spirit. But how does the soul relate to the body? Is it like a USB stick that simply plugs into the body? In which case the film is about the swapping of these two USB sticks and once they swap back everything is returned to normal? Or is it more complicated than that? Well stay tuned because this is where it gets really interesting. Towards the end of the film Millie manages to stab the butcher with the dola just before midnight and both characters are returned to their original bodies. The butcher is shot and taken into an ambulance in a critical condition. Millie has some downtime with her two best friends, Nyla and Josh. In true high school movie fashion, she gets the boy, Booker, and all is well with her family. Her mum even tells her that she should go to university. She's come to terms with the fact that Millie will leave the nest. That application to Boston. I want you to go. So the characters have made it through the hardship and are all the richer for the experience. At the end, your uh, main character is uh, richer for the experience, yeah? The movie could end there, but Christopher Landon has one last trick up his sleeve, the cheeky boy, along with co-writer Michael Kennedy. The butcher is still alive, and he manages to find Millie, leading to a final showdown. It is during this struggle that we get an insight into the film's view of how the soul relates to the body. You're being in your body. I understand why you feel so weak. You feel so meager. And all that anxiety that you got. Clinging to your dead dad. Now the butcher is clearly saying this to taunt her, but it's a revealing line. He now understands something of how Millie feels, her anxiety, her grief, and he has gained this understanding, it seems, by spending time in her body. That's strange. Perhaps body and soul aren't so easy to separate after all. Perhaps the state of the soul actually has an impact on the state of the body, and vice versa. It's not as simple as swapping two USB sticks. There is a residue of Millie's grief left behind in her body. And the butcher, even in his cold-hearted ways, is able to detect it. So that's the butcher. What about Millie? Is she completely back to normal? Or did the 24 hours inside a serial killer's body change her in some subtle way? We get a hint from what happens next. When the opportunity arrives, she picks up a detached table leg and rams it right through the butcher's body. This might be a nod to any number of mythologies in which the way to kill the beast is to drive a stake through its heart, vampires for instance. But more significantly, I think in this case, it echoes the start of the film. The butcher used household objects to impale people, and that's what we see Millie doing here. Notice the reactions of her mum and sister, they're shocked. Now of course, all three of them are trying to kill the butcher. But the instinctiveness with which Millie rams an entire cylinder of wood right through his body, they didn't see that coming. This is not the Millie they know. Something new has been unleashed. The only person who doesn't look surprised is the Butcher. Perhaps in this moment he recognises something of himself being expressed through Millie. Think about it, Millie has spent time inside his body, a body whose hands have committed the most terrible violence. And during that time, a murderous soul was inside her body. Swap them back, and things aren't quite returned to normal. There's an imprint, a memory, a 
pattern of behaviour that Millie's soul has now been exposed to, such that it's a little bit easier for her to cross the threshold into this kind of violence than it was before. Remember the beaver costume? We said that the beaver is an animal that looks harmless, but you don't want to get on the wrong side of it. It can chomp through solid wood. The beaver is a metaphor for Millie herself. She isn't the sort of person you'd normally be afraid of, but in this final scene, she's vicious. The table leg she wields even resembles a beaver-chewed log whistled at one end to a sharp point. A reminder that beavers can bite. What else can beavers do? They construct dams. Damn, Mel. And in this scene, we see a breaching of Millie's internal dam. She momentarily crosses the threshold into a new pattern of behaviour. The butcher has been defeated, but is there still some aspect of him that lives on inside Millie? Is there still some healing and deliverance that needs to take place? Millie gets the final line. I am a f***ing piece. And that pays off a line from earlier in the film when her self-esteem was much lower. You're a f***ing piece, girl. Oh, I'm a piece. Huh? So you could see this as an empowering moment. Millie has grown in self-confidence and we're seeing her standing strong as she defeats her oppressor. But I don't think it's quite so simple. Something about this final scene is disturbing. And the film seems to acknowledge that through the reactions of her mother and sister. In any case, the uncomfortable truth is that all of us have the potential to be vicious. If I were to spend time inside the body of a serial killer, it would probably be bad for my soul. But even if I don't, the line between good and evil runs through every human heart. So there we go. Freaky. A body swap high school slasher movie about the interaction between the body and the soul and grief. And as I've said, I think the film suggests that the body swap isn't quite reversible. What do you think? Of course, I'm not saying that the film's understanding of human beings is necessarily true to reality. It is a work of fiction, after all. But what I am saying is that horror films like Freaky explore some of the deepest questions, and they do so in an especially vivid and visceral way. If you'd like to continue these conversations and go even deeper, then can I invite you to join my brand new online Discord community? You can join for free, the link is in the description below. And if you'd like to get early access to my videos, bonus content, and even contribute to the writing of these videos, as well as supporting the channel, go to patreon.com forward slash Thomas Thurgood. Do subscribe if you'd like to stay in the loop. Thanks so much for watching, and I will see you soon.